Welcome back to Nature's Corner. My name is Erin Shaw. I'm a naturalist with Ohio Department of Natural Resources. On today's show, we're at Boyer's Farm with Brian Jord. And um, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, where we are here. Oh, thank you. We're, uh, this property was actually donated to the Cincinnati Zoo approximately 10 years ago or so. And we have almost 650 some acres here. So we held it for a while to try to think what we wanted to do with it. And then we uh, actually found out that part of the property was historically a natural wetland. So we looked around what was available as far as grants and we found the uh, Conservation Reserve Program, the CRP. And with that, we did, uh, basically developed the first 50 acres of the property. Uh, since then, we've used uh, the NACA grants and the EQIP to extend that to about 150 acres of uh, habitat improvement. And as you know, Ohio is the second leading state for percentage of lost wetlands, where over 90% of our natural wetlands have been lost uh, for various reasons to development. So with that, we were able to restore this. And once we restored it, the wildlife immediately came back. We've had bald eagles, sandhill cranes, soar rails. Uh, migration is impressive with waterfowl. Uh, the winter, we have everything from rough-legged hawks, um, harriers, all kinds of, of, of raptors moving through the area. So it's nice in the sea of suburbia that's developing here that we able, we're able to have a, an intact ecosystem within that that we can uh, use to uh, keep wildlife thriving here. This is a really neat place. So I'd love to come back and maybe take a, a, a closer look, like a full tour. We're just getting a little snippet This, this right is now. just the prairie part of yeah. it. Yeah, we have, uh, we're, we're raising browse for the zoo animals. We're, uh, we have a native plant program where we have plants available for sale to the public. But another facet of that program is also to uh, raise rare and endangered species of plants to go back into the wild for reintroduction. So there's a, there's a, lot, of, a lot of depth here that we can, we can go into. That's fascinating. Thank you so much for letting us come on. Right, and, thank uh, you. Yes. We have Bob to Bob in here with us. He's going to talk about uh, the research he's been doing with kestrels. So first, Bob, give us a little background about who you are and um, how you got started with this. All right. Well, thank you for having me, Aaron, and thank Joe for the cable television and uh, Brian for the uh, opportunity to talk here at the zoo property called the Boyer property. Uh, I think that it's a great place to visit if you ever have a chance to come out. The American Kestrel, um, before you can even do anything about that, you have to be licensed, and um, I have federal, state, and area license. There's 37 of us out of 11 million in, the, in, in Ohio and uh, this is my federal permit number and uh, what I'm allowed to do. And I had to work with three other people in order to uh, be certified by the government. I have a state permit and then an area permit. So what happens is uh, you have to go through a, a variety of rigorous testing and uh, basically identification, aging, and sexing of all animals. But in particular, we're talking about kestrels. Uh, American kestrels have had a bad time in the last 25 years. Uh, thanks to Sylvia, she has tried to show you that we've had a 21% decline. Like if America is 321 million people, third largest country in the world, we've lost 21% of all uh, kestrels in uh, the eastern United States. That'd be like probably eliminating, you know, 80 or so million Americans. And so you need to sort of understand why. And so part of the uh, tool of banding and capturing them is to try to understand their individual stories. You put them all together and then you can make, make a, a conclusion on what's happening in this particular population. So before we get started here, sorry to interrupt, let's, let's talk about specifically what is a kestrel because uh, how do you identify one? Uh, seems like when I was a kid I would see them all the time on the, on the telephone wires. And my grandpa called them sparrowhawks. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, but they lost their name. Uh, the biologists have this habit of going into closed rooms where nobody goes in, then they come out with a new name. And they decided that this species is very similar to the European kestrel. And so they just changed its name from sparrowhawk, where you might see that in the 1930s, back to the, uh, the American kestrel. And the kestrel gives honor to the, uh, the species that lives in Europe. Um, what we have here, is a series of things where you have to learn how to age and sex them. And they are told apart by the males having blue wings and a red tail. If Aaron turns that around, you can see the bluish wings. Girls have brown wings. The reddish tail, 
which is the, signifies a male, and the females have a brown tail with bands in it. And I have some more pictures to show you there. The um, kestrel is uh, struggling right now because of the um, a combination of things. It's not one thing, but like you said, when you were young, and I was young a long time ago, that um, they were everywhere. And every seems like wire or uh, placed by a grassy field, there was a kestrel there. The problem is that we've changed our uh, land use practices. We've introduced a thing called nicotinoids, which uh, kill insects. That's great for the farmers, but not so good for the uh, kestrels who depend on the insects for their summer food, and especially the young. And then we also have um, problems with the uh, increase of other raptors which eat them. Uh, in particular, Cooper's hawks are going up and the kestrels are going down. In Ohio, we have about 200 species of birds that breed here. 110 are stable, 33 are uh, increasing, and 55 species out of the 200 are decreasing. The kestrel is one of those ones that are decreasing right now. Uh, if you're interested in how long they live, here's the last 90 years. We finally got a new record this year of a kestrel living eight years. He didn't stay in Ohio, he didn't like it here. She went over to uh, near Charleston, uh, West Virginia, and she spent the last eight years there. But she was hatched by a guy called Dick Tuttle, Richard Tuttle, up in Delaware County. So if I run down here, you can see six years, five years, five years, five years, four years, four years, eight years. So that's pretty much the, uh, the maximum that we've had in 90 years. Be like you living to, if you, if you lived a Kestrel eight years, be like you living to 100. It's not impossible, but it's challenging. So why do Kestrels matter? I mean, who cares? Kestrel population is going down. What does that? They're an indicator of what's happening in the world. And some of the things that you can begin to see with the issues I brought up on the nicotinoids, land use practices, uh, things along this line, they are not doing well, so there's something obviously not correct. We believe that probably uh, the young are not, being re not replacing the number of adults that die. Uh, these die at a rate of about 15% a year, the adults, okay? The, ad the young, on the other hand, probably 70 or 80% of them die the first year of their life. It's a hard life. You, ha you hatch, life is hard, and you die. But if you can just get a couple of your brood to survive, you can replace yourself and uh, the population will be stable or increasing. That's not the case today. So you said part of their main diet is um, insects. Correct. Like grasshoppers and such. Grasshoppers, katydids, crickets. They love spiders. And they also get into um, tr um, these ones that make the noise at night, um, tr tree crickets or whatever. Yes. So they well, depend on them. So in instead the of uh, getting rid of the insects through chemicals, maybe we could just put up more kestrel boxes. Uh, that is a useful thing, and the kestrel boxes provide more opportunities for the uh, project. When Sylvia began the project, we had great difficulty. We only had like three or four pairs, and now we're uh, after five years, we've got it up to, I think, probably 14 or 15 pairs, if you take it all into account. So they seem to be coming back using the habitat of the ones where we have uh, in uh, Clinton County. Okay. So tell us some more about your research and then um, Sylvia's going to show us uh, her boxes and how she monitors them. Sounds good. Here's, uh, I've been doing the breeding bird survey for um, 27 years. It's where you drive down the road 25 miles, you stop every half a mile and you count everything that's within, um, I'm going to say a mile of where you're at or half mile. And you can see that in the summer, uh, excuse me, in the, in the winter, the kestrels are uh, very um, much into the northern part of the United States. Notice it's absent in Georgia and most of uh, Texas. Then in the winter, they shift down to the south. Uh, this might be a, maybe a five or six hundred mile shift in order to uh, survive the winters. Um, we find that our kestrels don't do that. Ours stay here year round, but the Canadians, the Michigan, Wisconsin's uh, kestrels, they do shift range. Uh, what we try to do is you have to age and sex them, so I'm going to try to show you how we do that. Like, here's a female. This is what she looks like when you're holding her in your hand. Uh, she has the, the banded tail, and she has brown wings, and she has a mask, a def 
uh, uh, mast that's uh, sort of like a peregrine here. If you look at my shirt, the peregrine falcon's in the same family right here. It's the peregrine over here. That's the fastest bird in the world, maybe the fastest animal in the world. They're related to them. They have a unique feature on their bill for breaking the neck of the prey, and it's a notch. If you can turn here, I don't know, Joe, if you can grab that, but there's a notch there that they use to actually bite the back of the mouse, and it severs the spinal cord. And they're real good when they grab it, one bite, and it's over. And of course, the peregrine and the merlin are the other two falcons that can do this. So m the, most falcons have one face stripe. Is that what you call I it? I think so. Have two? There's sort of a mask there. Um, there's one that doesn't have any, and that would be the jur falcon. Okay. And that's from the Arctic. And so as a result, you have a, an interesting thing that uh, they, they specialize in grouse and so forth. And these are little bitty guys. They're about the size of a blue jay, right? That's right. Yeah. The guys are coming in about 110 to 125 grams. And the girls, the girls will like this, uh, are the dominant ones. And they, uh, they weigh somewhere between 125 and 145. I think that's there because they defend the nest and the young. And the male's out there catching food and de you know, defending the territory. You have the heavy lifting, I really think, to take care of the young and keep the owls and other predators that may get in there, raccoons in particular. Yeah. Um, the males, as you can see, have the nice blue wings, slate gray blue and the red tail. And they have an interesting thing on the back of their head called a deflage. And I think your Kestrel may have that. He's well, he did. Uh, Anyways, it looks like fake eyes. It'd yours. be like turning around, Aaron, and you don't you, turn around. She would have fake eyes on her back so that when a predator sees her and she's eating or uh, she's out moving around, it seems, seems to think that they're trying to um, watch for the predator and they won't attack. Because mm -hmm. the eyes are the things that they basically, um, you see moths and butterflies have eyes on their wings in order to frighten mm -hmm. the, uh, the predators away. Well. Kestrel's no different. Okay, you got your male and your female. You have their age. Now I'd like to show you some of the things that we do to uh, age them. Now they're not going to talk to you, so you basically have to read their body. And we use on girls, the females, the, the subterminal band. If it's twice the size, it's an older animal. If it's the same size as all the other bands, then it's a young of the year. And the um, females seem to um, form a pair bond somewhere in March. They're shopping around. The guys are trapped. The guys are trapped on a particular territory defending it. So the girls sort of pass through the territory. And if her husband from the previous year is there, maybe she would uh, you know, s select that same site. If not, uh, since there's such a high rate of turnover, that they, they may move on. The, uh, Male, as you can see, is a uh, nice golden, just golden on the front, with that mask that you're talking about there. And uh, they basically are the hunters. And they bring the food into the female and to the young, and then she carves it up. If you can imagine sitting down at the table and you're chewing the head off of a mouse and the legs and stuff, and then feeding it to the young, or the grasshopper, whatever it is. I just catch it, you feed it, that sort of thing. Um, when, after we capture them, uh, this is how we capture them. Here's a uh, male that we captured along a road called Harveysburg Road. You see that we have a trap, and I'll show them to you in a moment. And inside the trap, we put mice. And these mice are um, just out of nesting boxes. Sometimes we collect them out of our barns and stuff. And uh, they are the prey, but they don't get harmed usually. Usually. Uh, the kestrel sitting on the wire sees these down there comes down and attacks. And what it does, if you want to hold that guy right there, this is the old one we used to use. Trouble is, we started catching bigger birds like red tail hawks and stuff, and so they'll just carry this away. It's too light. But if you look at this up close, Joe, you will see that it's covered with 20 pound fishing line. And as the hawk comes down to kill the mouse, which he can't do, he then gets his talons in there and tries to pick up, and he's captured there. And if you look at uh, Aaron's picture there, he's spread out on the ground right beside the two mice in the trap. And uh, it's a very successful way. Balshatri, B-A-L hyphen C-H-A-R-T-I. It's an Asian Indian trap that they use to uh, 
use for falconry and stuff like that. Well, we've moved up and we went to industrial strength straps. Mm -hmm. This has a big rod of steel down here to show you how effective it was. We were out trapping and we saw a kestrel. We set it down on the side of the road in the grass, backed up, and right away a red-shouldered hawk, which weighs about two or three pounds, came in. And he came in and as soon as he saw that, he was on it because he was hungry in the winter. And then what happens? 20 pound test. He comes down to kill it. Look at that. And that's a three pound, uh, that's a three pound trap. Hangs there. And of course, he's just flopping around in the, in the ditch beside the road. We go back, extract him. And then we do the, uh, the other things to, uh, to take the measurements on him. Balshatri traps are probably hundreds of years old. Okay, we've got him in the car. We basically put a fish and wildlife band, it's an aluminum band, sort of like my wife banded me 38 years ago, today, by the way. Oh, and so wow. uh, you basically have a, uh, it's like a social security number that they get from the Fish and Wildlife Service, which is in uh, Laurel, Maryland, halfway between Baltimore and Washington, D.C. And this uh, a a number identifies them from any other number, any fish, wolverine, bear, deer, or other bird. It's a unique number to them. And then we put these colored markings on there to sort of keep track of them. And you might say, well, why put colors? You already got a band on them. Well, we can't catch the bird all the time. And as a result, uh, the colors indicate the year that it was trapped. So we use a different color each year. So the aluminum bands on the left leg and the color band for that particular year was on the last one. Like the last year was a light green. And the light green represented 20 19 this spring. Then we also put a, uh, another band over the aluminum band which gives the location. So not only when uh, we see the bird on the wire or I have a camera, a trail camera that I put outside the box, about from me to you, you're coming in to feed the kids. Well I got the trail and it's, as they hook on the side, you've seen bluebirds do this and so forth, you can see the band color and stuff like there and identify who is that hmm. person and uh, you don't have to get the band and read it. So this is a, a unique little way. Again, you gotta have a special permit for these things too, but um, it's, I used it with tufted titmice and also with uh, American kestrels. Here is some, uh, some uh, I don't know if you can see this one, Joe, but you can see my mouse and uh, you can see the trap, the, the noose is all across the top there. And we have a little game that Sylvia and I play with the mouse. For every hawk he catches, he gets a field promotion. You start as a private. And then as you catch more hawks, you move up to a, you know, a corporal, a sergeant, a lieutenant, a major. We've had a couple of generals. And when you get a, become a general mouse, you're released back into the wild because you've already done your, your duty for science. I digress there for a minute. Mm -hmm. But uh, here are the bands that you can actually see on a kestrel. And these have been on them for two years. You can see we had orange, it's a little bit faded out over the aluminum, and it was the yellow year. Yellow year was um, 2016. So we could tell that this animal had moved about a mile and a half from where it originally was young, and uh, was a young female there. And we can judge their um, distance. Now this helps us to understand how long they live, where they're moving, and from this you can basically come up and we've captured, recaptured here. So a if someone finds nine, a nine different adults. Wow. Okay, so one doesn't tell a story. In science, we base it on uh, statistics and, and so forth. Of, you need to at least get 10. We're one away from being able to say something. These are all living ones. Yes, they were all captured alive. Well, I'm sorry, this guy croaked. Got hit by a car trying to get a bug off the road. How many, how many dead ones are reported in? Hmm. Do you know? Don't. I've marked over 215 uh, adult kestrels. Sylvia's the, the, deals with the kids, and I would say um, I would say 80% of the ones that people send in are dead. You know, they find them on the road. Uh, they run into a window chasing a sparrow, uh, or they just you know find them along the uh, uh, yard dead. But these guys are the ones that we actually have data on for a period of time. So we're getting close. Nine of them. So what we want to do is to try to form a picture, and one person is not a picture, you must take a group of people. And so I think that we're about halfway through. Maybe after uh, 10 years, we'd have something to say. 
but it's um, right now they stay pretty much in the area that they uh, that they were originally banded or hatched. So if someone finds a, a dead bird by the road, maybe it's worth checking to see if it has a band and they can turn in the information. Yeah, you just pull out your smartphone or you go to your computer and you type in bird band and then they'll say, okay, yeah, you're reporting a band, you click that on the menu and then you basically tell them when, where, and why, why you got that bird. Then they send you a certificate, call you a hero for finding this animal and they send me a report that says, sorry, but uh, your, your, your study object is now dead. Well, I suppose you could do research, too, to find out what was the cause of death. Right. Collisions are the big thing with kestrels, it seems like, um, with cars, windows. Uh, but then there's a more subtle, insidious one that I mentioned to you, the nicotinoids, the lack of grasshoppers. When I was young, in um, like 1950s and 60s, um, you could, there were clouds of grasshoppers and katydids, and now you walk along here, You'll see them, but they're just not present in enough mm -hmm. numbers to support the young. And the young are the one that have the high mortality rate. Once you make it through a winter, you had a pretty good chance of um, living, what I said, four or five years. So we're hoping that we can, uh, through nest boxes that Sylvia will talk about, and through uh, you people reporting the bands that you find from the birds that hit your windows, we can begin to form a story about uh, what's ha happening. I'm sure we have a lot to do with that. I'm not gonna mention climate change because uh, that's sort of a controversial thing. And I think that the information is incom incomplete right now. It's sort of like you're sick, but you don't know exactly why until you run some tests. So we still are running tests on that, but I do think that there's something that is affecting um, some of the insect populations and the rodent populations in the winter. If there's deep snow, um, they have trouble finding food. If there's shallow snow, there's plenty of food, and they just simply sit there. And this is an interesting thing, Joe. The kestrels sit on the wire, and of course, you have three receptors. You can see, I think it's red and yellow and violet or something, or blue, or something like that. They can see ultraviolet light. So when they're sitting on a wire, you think they're just sunning themselves. No, 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 no. They're looking down at the grass, and they have a fourth cone in their eye for sensing ultraviolet light. Guess what has ultraviolet light? Mouse poop. Mice poop and pee. <laughs> so if you're coming down the road, Aaron, and you're flying along, and you sit on a wire, and it's all green. Well, I think I'll move somewhere else. But if you see one where the poop and pee is, that's a good place to hunt. And so they sit there, and that's their patient. And any kind of motion, uh, they'll basically attack. So uh, they have a unique thing that sort of get them through the tough times there. I, he I heard a show, I don't know if it's a podcast, about colors. Last week, it was fascinating. It is, and so as we get better technology, the technology's pointing us in different directions so we can explore. And like I said, science is, the beauty of science is it's never finished. It's always out there, uh, ready to be explored with new technology, new uh, formulas, new things that come out. And so what we know today will probably be different from tomorrow, but we have to try to figure out why are we losing so many of the animals? So I've do you heard, encourage the community to get involved, like to, to put up boxes and so forth? I do. The, the boxes are essential to give them the habitat because we don't have dead trees hollowed out by red belly and red belly woodpeckers and uh, uh, northern flickers. So we depend on them to give them the, the I think, because everything is so intensively form, farmed. It's, it's, there is no fence rows very much if you go out to uh, eastern Clinton County and even parts of Warren County. I mean, it's intense. So there isn't a lot of places for the mice and the grasshoppers and the things that they need to eat. So it's an ongoing struggle and we basically have to all work together. As my, my favorite phrase is, so goes the bird, so goes the human race. You think back to 1962 with Rachel Carson mm. and she warned us about DDT, DDE, chloridane, all these things that were killing the, uh, uh, well it started with the the great bird kill up on Michigan State University. They went through and said, we're going to kill the Dutch elm disease. They said, well, they sure did. They sprayed the whole campus, 1,000 acres or so, and then all the spray washed into the soil. The worms ate the soil. That's what they ate. And then the robins eat the worms. There was 2,000 flopping around robins on the ground dying as a result of eating contaminated worms. And the average robin's supposed to have 12 foot of worm a day hmm. to stay alive. Well. We were killing them, not directly, but indirectly through the food chain. And you talk about the kestrel and their decline. Well, 
there's something out there which we are exploring to try to find out what that might be. Well, I think the nicotinoids are pretty tough, but I don't have enough evidence yet. Bob, this research that you're doing is, is uh, really important. Thank you for sharing this information. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So we're here now with Sylvia Hadley. Good. And um, you work with Bob Tobobbin right. doing research. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit more about your background and uh, how you got started with this. Okay. So I'm actually a retired CPA. And after spending 30 years looking at a computer screen and numbers, um, when I got out of that, I decided that I wanted to do some outdoor kind of things. And so I've been working with the bird conservation efforts, particularly for banding and nest box, nest box monitoring. And I started with purple martins. I've got a purple martin colony in my yard. And through that, I learned kind of the importance of monitoring and getting the data to a national database and um, all the things that you can do with that. And after that, I went to um, volunteer for Caesars Creek at, for the Army Corps of Engineer program for the Bluebird Trail. Mm -hmm. And then when I got into banding, um, Bob encouraged me to work on um, kestrel boxes because it's kind of like the next, the next step up in terms of difficulty and um, also it's a, it's a great tool for uh, conservation efforts for the kestrels. And this is something that a community member could do. Yeah, yeah, they certainly can. It's a little tricky in that the box has to be situated um, anywhere 10 to 20 feet up in the air. I don't know if you can see um, kind of our territory here, but we're in a perfect spot. We've got the box up high. They like to hunt. They sit on top of the boxes and then they hunt the grassy area below. Um, they're better off if they're away from busy roads, kind of a, away from houses a little bit. Um, so you need the right spot in order to attract kestrels, but uh, it's certainly very manageable to do as a volunteer. Yeah. So do you do like a monitoring workshops or you turn your information into Bob? What? So um, at this point, I, I'm in the fifth year of my project and my intention actually is to turn it into the American Kestrel Partnership, mm -hmm. which is part of the Peregrine Fund. It's run out of Boise, Idaho, okay. and they collect data nationwide on how the kestrels are doing, and specifically on box activity. But here at the zoo property, um, this box is one of many boxes. They've got bluebird boxes, and they turn all that data into um, the Nest Watch program, which is part of Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And they collect data from all kinds of nest boxes all across the country. So this kestrel box ends up having its data go through with everything else here in the zoo. Very interesting. Yeah. So? So you want to talk about the box a little bit? Sure. So um, this box is different than the typical bluebird box in that it's got a three inch hole. Um, there are a number of patterns out there on the internet. Um, this one, uh, the pattern that works best actually kind of depends on where you're going to put the box. This box is set up to go on a barn um, and it opens such that it covers the hole when you, when you open the box. So if you're looking in, the kestrels can't, they would have to fly up out of the top. They're not going to just jump out of the hole, which is, which is a good thing. Um, it's also got, um, it's got a little uh, thing that the young can crawl out of the hole. It's got um, like ridges. Yeah, yes. ridges or in this case it's gutter guard. And we've got some kind of decoy holes on the side or um, they're not holes actually. They just, just look like a hole to get the kestrel's attention so that they will find the box. Yeah. So I know an ODNR has a pattern on their mm -hmm. website. And it's a, it's a good pattern. We've used that for some of the boxes in Clinton County. Where yes, and we try to always use the ones that open from the lid. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. That's great, yeah. Some of them open on the side, but you can still access them. I mean, if you're just careful, um, it all works out fine. Okay. Yeah. So what I do for monitoring is I check the boxes every two weeks, hopefully. That's my intention. And I... Um, I I have a philosophy that I do not want to be raising European starlings in my boxes. So part of the two week time frame is if I uh, check it within two weeks, um, if there are starlings in there, 
I can extract and get rid of the nest and the eggs. I don't have to deal with young birds. So starlings are invasive species. Starlings are invasive. There's actually only two species in our part of North America where you can inter, um, intercept or do any kind of intervention in terms of destroying their nest or mm -hmm. eliminating their nest or touching those birds if you're not a, a licensed bird bander. Because they'll the actually go in and kill little other baby yes, birds, right? Yeah, yeah. The starlings are very aggressive. They have a really strong beak, and so they're... Um, they can be very destructive for our native birds. Yeah. So that's why, I'm, that's why I take that, that approach. So I go every two weeks. And the other thing that that does for me is it lets me know the, who's using the box. Because sometimes the bluebirds will use the box. Uh, crested flycatchers will use the box. Other birds might use it. Um, so I know like who's in there and when the first egg is laid, if there's a kestrel nesting in there. And knowing when the first egg is laid, it's going to let me calculate then um, when they're going to hatch and when they're going to fledge. And if they disappear out of the box before they could survive, I can, I can tell that too because I know like what, how long they should be in there, basically. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. And so again, all this data, um, the Kestrel, American Kestrel Partnership wants you to collect all that data and give it to them. And um, so do the nest watch people. So yeah. do you, you band the babies? Right, right. So the other thing about knowing the age is we know when they're going to be the right age for banding. And for our kestrel young, and when they're 13 days to up to when they're about 20 days, well, we take them out and band them. And um, Bob brought these pictures. Here's a couple that we had in hand. These are just the right size for banding. They're probably 16 days old. They need to be big enough that you can can sex them so you can see the gray feathers coming out here on the wing and this is actually a female which we can't see her wing but I can tell from her tail that um, she's going to be a little female so yeah we banned the young and um, as he was Bob referenced the the uh, record for the American kestrel and that was actually a bird that was banded as a, in a in a nest box hmm. um, of Dick Tuttle up by Columbus wow. so. Yeah, it's exciting. So of the nine that he mentioned, yeah. were any of them from your boxes or the, the return no, birds? No, no. Oh, okay. So I have, I've only been doing this for five years and actually it's kind of ramped up. So I started with about 15 boxes. Right now I've got 19. And the first year only two of them were used and then I tweaked it. That's the other thing about monitoring your boxes, you know who's using it and uh, whether it's a good site or not. So you, I ended up moving some of them to better sites. And um, also over time, uh, the birds find the boxes. Like this box here at the zoo has been here probably three years or so. Mm -hmm. And this, this spring was the first year it was utilized by the kestrels. And it's in a perfect spot. So they have to find the box, they have to decide they want it. And it just takes a while to get established. But once, they, once they've nested in the box, they're pretty faithful to come back to that same spot. Hmm. So if someone wants to put up a kestrel box or help with these conservation efforts mm -hmm. what's the best way for a, a community member to, to get involved and help yeah I would say they want to do some research first they need to be uh, comfortable with um, with dealing with the height because it, it's actually almost counterproductive to put up the boxes as I say have starlings use them so you need to be able to monitor them mm -hmm. to be uh, to put them up and have them be helpful to the birds and so uh, do you have meetings or conferences or a way that people could get more information on birding and banding in Ohio? Yeah, um, it's, in terms of kestrel specifically, the American Kestrel Partnership does actually do a conference every few years, not locally, but nationwide. And um, there are probably, in Southern Ohio, there's probably five or six of us that are doing this kind of a project and any of us I'm sure would be willing to to help somebody get started yeah well because Bob had a uh, um, bird banding conference the Ohio bird banding conference yes yeah, yeah right so. and you guys built some kestrel boxes there right mm -hmm. too? yes yeah good yeah. yeah so that's it that would be a good way to network and um, I would recommend so when I got started Bob and I went up and visited Dick Tuttle in Delaware and he showed us his, his route and how he set up the boxes. He showed me how he raises and lowers some of his and how he climbs poles for 
ones that are up and um, that was very helpful. So it also gave me an idea whether I really wanted to do it or not. Okay. Because there's, there's work involved. Oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so do you want to, do you want to look at the, yeah. the pole here? Mm -hmm. Okay. So this one is an interesting design. It actually came from somebody in Wisconsin, I think. And my husband has kind of tweaked it, uh, to make it, make it workable for me. So one thing we didn't talk about yet is predator guards because raccoons like to climb the poles and eat the young ones. So on any of my poles, I will put a predator guard to keep out raccoons and snakes. And then um, what we've got here is a pole that's going to pivot down so we don't have to climb. Do you want me to help you or you got uh, it? No, okay. it's, a one person, it's a one person job. So this rope is to keep it from swinging in the wind. Um, and, uh, so you do this when there's babies in there? Yeah. Okay. As a matter of fact, we do it, uh, even the adult, the female sitting on the eggs, she'll just ride down in the box. You peek, open up and peek in and she just sits there. Wow. Yeah. And then we do it with the young too. So I've got a little rod here that's, um, kind of going through the pieces to hold this together. Okay, let me help you. Uh, yeah, can you pull? There. All right, great, thank you. Let me hold that. Yeah, can you, can you take care of that? So, so this box, oh, what we I want see. is for it to stay upright. Wow. And, um, so, so mm -hmm. it's nice that, that uh, the box comes to you instead of yeah. you having to go to the box. And um, as you can see, it's not beautiful at this point because the birds have been using it, um, but that's, that's the way it is. It was nice and pristine when, when it went up. But this design is particularly useful in this situation because um, it's got this tall back so that it'll work in terms of the pivot. So that's where... I, it depends on where you're going to put the box and how you're going to do it, what design you want. But um, it's not, again, it's not beautiful in there, but you can see that there's uh, some feathers where they caught probably young birds, small birds, and fed them to the, to the kestrels. There's some, uh, some bones in there. There's probably some pellets uh, with uh, mouse fur and such. But uh, when it started out, it was beautiful and clean, but it doesn't. Maybe it doesn't it's beautiful to them because they have the <laughs> ultraviolet, you know, it's yeah, like right, right. rainbows that's in there. That's right. That's right. So I put nesting, I put uh, cedar chips or pine chips in the bottom. Kestrels don't build nests in anything. They just, they just uh, lay their eggs on whatever their nesting site is. So that cushions the eggs and protects them. Um, for this box and all the other ones, I'm going to come go through this fall and cl clean out all that nasty kind of stuff. Um, I'll probably use a face mask when I do that because uh, I don't want to be breathing that dust from there. But uh, we'll, I'll clean it out and I'll put in fresh bedding. And then I'll check them again in the spring and put in more if they need it. That's really neat. So yeah. uh, out of... Out of all of this, what, what's the main thing that stands out in your mind? Like, what, what have you learned or what would you like to... Well, for one thing, I mean, it's just so fun. The young ones are so gorgeous and um, I, I just am really grateful to be able to do something that I enjoy so much and that's uh, helpful to the, to the birds. Because part of the, part of the problem probably is that they don't have nesting sites. And that's just one piece of their difficulty in terms of their decline. But lack, we don't have that many snag trees around anymore. People like to have things clean and, mm -hmm. and cleared out. And we don't have that much um, farmland and, and good sites. So. And, and um, fighting against the starlings, too. Is, yeah, yeah, right. They will, if a, if a kestrel really wants the box, it would win out over a starling because it's got that falcon kind of fierceness to it. Just eat but it. If this, <laughs> yeah, probably. But if the starlings are really established, they're not going to bother with trying to kick it out of the box. Yeah. So. yeah. yeah. Thank you for the research that you're doing. And um, I know this takes quite 
some time and effort. If, if you don't have a pivot pole, you have to put a ladder up there, right? Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. But um, it's, it's not hard to do, and it's well worth the effort to do it. Yeah, because yeah. like I said, uh, when I was a kid, I saw them all the time. Right. And I, uh, maybe I just haven't been looking, but it seems like five years or more, I haven't really seen any. Yeah, they're around, but definitely in decline. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So anything we can do to help them, it's good? It is good. And it, like Bob was saying, it's an indicator right. of our environment. Right. I mean, they're in decline, so something yeah. is causing that. So. And what you're doing with the education is good too. I mean, that's one of the things we do with banding. It's, it's, it also raises people's awareness as they come and watch. And people love to come see when we band the baby kestrels because yeah. they're just so cute. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, thank you, Sylvia, for being yeah. on the show and, and for the work that you're doing. It's my pleasure. Thank you, Erin. That's it for today's show. If you have any more questions, you can check us out online at ohiostateparks.gov or we'll see you on the trails.